Well, good morning, and thanks for showing up early for a PowerShell session. Obviously, this is uh, Webster's Adventures into Documenting with PowerShell, and believe it or not, I'm Webster. And I'm an independent consultant. I'm based out of Nashville, Tennessee, in case y'all can't tell by my accent. I talk a little different. I've been a CTP since 2010. I run the website, carlwefter.com, the accidental citrus admin, because if you ever find me doing any administration work on your citrus farm, it's purely by accident. And I'm easy to reach. Email, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, I'm all over the place. What we're going to be covering today, the history of these documentation scripts, current scripts, what the scripts do and how, challenges faced, being faced, future of the current scripts, and future scripts. Now, these are not discrete agenda items. I kind of got a little ADD, ADHD, so we're going to be talking about all of these all kind of commingled in there. The history of these scripts really begins with community support because I could not have done this, uh, all these scripts, without all the involvement uh, from people in the community. And I've had uh, some major contributors. I've had people who have uh, contributed lots of code. I've had people who contributed uh, functions. I've had people who have spent hours with me debugging the, and testing the scripts. I've had people who have uh, supported me with a lot of patient teaching because I am not a PowerShell developer. I am not a programmer. Uh, I'm not a PowerShell geek. I'm just a regular goober. And a lot of this PowerShell stuff just goes right over my head. This stuff does not come easy for me. I have to brute force my way and I'm like a bulldog when I'm trying to solve some of the issues. I just have to read and read and read and sometimes the stuff still goes right over my head. So what I hope to show you in all of this is you don't have to be a coding wizard. I'm just a regular guy who just needed to learn PowerShell to solve customer problems and I wound up doing it, but not without a lot of help. Another thing I needed, because there are now so many scripts, I had to have lots of testers. Uh, I had to have people who run the stuff in America, not in America, uh, small farms, large farms, farms with hundreds of servers, thousands of servers, uh, hundreds, thousands of VDisk and uh, you know Zen desktops, uh, it's amazing all of the different environments that I needed help testing. There's, there's no way one person could have done all this. And as you can see by all the names, there were a lot of people involved in helping me uh, test and develop these scripts. And the thing is, is I always can use more testers and more contributors. So if you would like to help test, or like to help contribute to the script, I'd be more than happy to accept your help. And who knows, maybe next year, your name and or picture could be up here. The other thing, this is not an American thing. I've had testers and contributors from all around the world help with this. And the nice thing about that is you get different perspectives and viewpoints on how things should be done. Uh, I really try to take into account uh, the different uh, languages and nationalities. But what is amazing is that from all of the testers and all of the contributors and all the countries, you still don't find issues with the scripts until you actually release them to the world community and then people start finding issues. And then it's those people that I tester to become testers. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so the history of the scripts. You know, at one time, I was once a professional tuba player. I'm actually a classically trained musician. How do you like that? That picture's from uh, spring of 1977. I was all of uh, 20 years old. And as you can tell by the hair and the uh, whiskers, Jim Moyle, Stefan Therion, man, they didn't have anything on me in the hair in the look. I was 133 pounds of a mean, lean, tuba playing machine. But, like most musicians, 
I had to find a way to actually make money. So I got into IT in September 1977, working on uh, IBM mainframes. And over the years, I've gone from uh, mainframes to PCs and doing accounting software and then doing uh, Nobel Networks. At one time, I actually uh, managed 650 Nobel Networks around the United States. And then in um, 2001, I went cold turkey off Nobel and moved into Windows Networks and Active Directory. And then also uh, the accounting software I used to work with, uh, we were one of the original uh, vendor or uh, uh, partners for uh, the original Citrix product, multi-user OS2, back in late 89, early 90. We were one of the uh, first testers for that product. So I've been around uh, Citrix for a very long time. And then over the years, 2001, then uh, uh, in 2004, I added Exchange and some SharePoint stuff in there and started doing some very large Active Directory migrations and stuff. And then I uh, met people like uh, Krista Anderson and Krista Griffin, Michael B. Smith, and then they started encouraging me to write about all these projects. And what I realized was that and there's all kinds of stuff out there for Active Directory. And there's all kinds of stuff out there for Exchange. But there really wasn't anything on the Citrix side for us beginners, for the people who, you know, Citrix is it's just a, a part of the job that you did. And so in October 2008, I went to my very first uh, Citrix conference. I went to a Tech Edge in Orlando, Florida in October 2008 and met a lady by the name of Joe Harder. And talked to her and said, hey, I want to start a website, and but I want to cover it from the aspect of, you know, helping people like me who are accidental Citrix admins actually learn uh, these Citrix products and stuff. And she was just like, well, that's a really good idea. So in November 2008, the original CarlWebster.com accidental Citrix admin site was launched. And then I kept writing more articles on learning the basics of stuff, uh, started adding some Zen server stuff, a little bit of Zen desktop, some PBS stuff. And then in April 2010, I was honored uh, to be called a Citrix technology professional. And then in January 2011, I made the decision that I wanted to go independent because I'm really not a full-time employee type person. I like being brutally honest uh, with customers and about products, and that really doesn't sit well when you work for uh, Citrix Platinum Partners, um, and you really don't care for Zen Desktop and the fact that they want everyone to use Zen Desktop, no matter what the use case. So I decided it was time to go solo. So on February 1, 2011, I hit the streets, and my very first customer was a large drugstore chain in the in the U.S. with a very large global operation. What they had was they had a Zenit 5 2003 farm that was so unstable, they were having to reboot every day, every server in that farm from four to eight times per day. Uh, meaning that users weren't getting much work done and the environment was just, uh, what do y'all say here, pants? Is that the right thing, pants? Um, so they hired me for three months to see if I could come in and help stabilize and resolve the issues they were having in their Zenat 5 farm. Well, after nine weeks, we actually had everything fixed that you could fix or that I was authorized to fix. Because it's amazing, uh, I don't know if any of y'all have ever come to or watched any of my AD sessions or the videos, there are these, uh, mythical things that exist on Windows servers called event logs. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of like uh, unicorns and dragons and honest politicians. Most people think they don't exist and that they're mythical. Well, when you start going through event logs on servers, the servers are trying to tell you what's actually wrong with them. And so by just going through the only, just going through the event logs, I was able to resolve most of their stability issues. And then the fact that they had never applied any updates, Microsoft or Citrix, to any of these servers, you know, 
also didn't help matters. So we got all that taken care of. And so after nine weeks, we were down to just a weekly reboot. Servers were humming along, and they were just like, wow, this is really nice. You got three weeks left. Tell you what, why don't you just hang around just in case we have any questions or anything comes up, you know, you're just here. And then they said, oh, by the way, since how you're just basically just going to be sitting here and just in case someone wants to ask you a question, we don't have any documentation on the Zenit 5 farm. We don't know anything about the servers. Uh, and we don't know anything about the Zenapp environment. Uh, we know that some servers use farm settings and some servers don't. And we got a bunch of policies, a bunch of load evaluators, lots of custom administrators. Uh, is there any way you could document this for us? So I'm sitting on the phone with them going like, no problem. Three weeks, I can get it done. Hang up the phone and up. So, so what they're saying is they wanted me to go through and document all their administrators, applications, servers, zones, all the farm properties, all the server properties, all the stuff in the advanced configuration, and all of their policy settings. And I mean, they had hundreds of policies. That's what it looked like when I hung up the phone. I was like, oh crap. How do you do that? Uh, if I did one server every two hours, I could not have their entire farm documented in three weeks at 40 hours a week. And I was like, oh, okay, what do you do? Okay, um, all right, I used to do Exchange. And Exchange 2007, they had this thing, PowerShell. I knew how to spell PowerShell. And I was like, didn't I see something a while back with Citrix, uh, PowerShell, and Zen app? So I Googled. And I was just like, oh, okay. This Michael Bubble Beats uh, has this little article. And it was like, oh, okay. So I can do something like get XA Farm. Get XA application, get XA server. Oh, and I should be able to get the information out of the Citrix stuff and maybe be able to do something. I was like, oh, this is Zen App 6. They got anything for Zen App 5? And then I found this, and I was just like, oh, cool. So I should be able to do this. And so I started looking and I was like, okay, why is it? get XA server and not get XA servers because don't I want to do servers and applications and stuff like that and so I had to learn that no things in PowerShell are singular and things they return are called objects and what do you do with those objects how do I take that stuff that I see on the screen and actually put it into a file that I can then use to create a word document and so then I said, well, you know, they're also wanting some server information along the way. So as I'm developing these scripts, um, I kind of ran into a uh, oops moment. You know how you just Google for stuff and you find something on the internet and you go, oh, someone's already done this in PowerShell, I'll just copy their code. So I said, well, how can I do something like uh, get the number of processors or cores and how much RAM and how many hard drives and hard drive space and how much free space, where's the page file? You know, because these people, their servers had, you know, three hard drives and they had the page file spread around. And so how do I get all that information? Oh, WMI, cool. Found some code, copied it in. First time I ran the script, I took down every Zenap 5 server. As the script hit that server, the server died. Uh, so I was like, okay, so maybe not WMI. And I removed all the WMI stuff because when you're running the stuff during production and you start taking down <coughs> servers, that doesn't look very good. But then also, once I fixed my oops, I came around and saw there were some things in this Citrix PowerShell stuff. I was just like, what the were they thinking? So 
I mean, it's like something simple like the very first farm property. Connection access control. Pretty simple. There's only three settings, any connections. Uh, there's one with three different connection types and one with one. So I'm thinking, okay, well, the PowerShell stuff returns, okay, allow any connection actually equals any connection. Then the next one, allow one type only. So I'm thinking, oh, okay, one type only. That's gotta be Citrix Access Gateway Connections only. Uh-uh. They allow one type only is the one that has three connections. Allow multiple types is the one with one type. And you're sitting there going, huh? And then you got the other things where they got these things like disable this. Well, when you do the checkbox, you have actually enabled the property. And so when you're looking at the PowerShell stuff, you're going, okay, oh, if it's enabled, okay, the application's enabled. If it's disabled, the application's disabled. No. If it's enabled, that means you have selected the checkbox to disable the application. So if it's enabled, it's disabled. If it's disabled, it's enabled. I'm, I'm, yeah. Eventually, over the period of three weeks, I was able to get just the basics done to where I could run the stuff, just grab whatever PowerShell return and create an output file. Now, I didn't do things the PowerShell way because like I said, I'm not a PowerShell person. I'm not, you know, I, I had three weeks to learn PowerShell and all of its intricacies and figure out all this stuff that was in the Xanath 5 PowerShell command list and try to create a document and make sure that all the stuff that I got in the report actually matched what was in all the consoles. Then I had to take this document, open it up into Word, add a cover page, add a table of contents, add page numbers, add footers, then go through and manually do heading one, heading two, heading three, manually for every page, you know, for all the different applications and servers and policies and administrators and load evaluators and so on and so forth. All that was still manual because I couldn't figure out how to do objects and all that stuff. So I just did everything as text because that's just what I knew to do. But the customer loved it, even with all the manual stuff. They really liked it because now they had the stuff documented and they gave me a glowing recommendation on LinkedIn because of this. So I had to do this because, well, the customer had a problem. They had no documentation. And in reality, I didn't know how to get on documentation on a very large environment manually. Because they had a lot of crap. And they had a lot of servers and a lot of policies and a lot of customer administrators. And I didn't know how in the world to do it. PowerShell was able to get it done for me. So in this instance, PowerShell helped me solve this customer problem and get me a glowing recommendation. So the current scripts. The Zenet 5 script was written in April 2011 uh, for this customer. Then in September 2011, I got hired by a customer to take them off of a extremely botched Zen Desktop 5 implementation where the Citrix Platinum partner had decided that they were going to do two Zen server hosts and each host was going to have a domain controller a PPS server, a SQL server, a file server, uh, a Zenapp server, uh, zone data collectors, uh, a DDC, and 13 Zen desktops on a dual quad core Zen server host. Needless to say, you can imagine what performance was like. They hated it, and the Platinum partner was never able to resolve it because the only way to re to have resolved that was to bring in more Zen server hosts. Well, they didn't want to. So they brought me in to bring, uh, put in Zen App 6 because they thought it was a problem with Zen Desktop. And so while I'm doing that, I said, and then they asked, when you're finished, the Citrix partner never left us any documentation. So when you get all this Zen App 6 stuff going, will you leave us documentation? I was like, sweet. <laughs> 
can't begin to write another script. So, that is September 2011. A long time from April. I didn't release the scripts. Because I was like, who would find these scripts useful? You know, I, I'm just me. I'm just little me from Tullahoma, Tennessee. I'm not a PowerShell guy. Who would want the, and so more than likely it was Jari and Gibson who talked me into it because Jari and talks me into all kinds of stuff, talked me into releasing the scripts. So on September 30th of 2011, I released the ZenApp 6 script, even though it was written second. And the ZenApp 5 script, um, because I only had access to ZenApp 5 in 2003, I had to rely on a friend of mine here in the UK, James Rankin, who was running the script on the ZenApp 5 2008 farm, who then kept emailing me, you don't have this, you don't have this, you're missing this, oh, the wording for this is different in ZenApp 5 2008. Oh, this stuff's in a different order in ZenApp 5 2008. And so I'm blindly trying to change the script to run on ZenApp 5 2008 and having no access to a ZenApp 5 2008 farm. So that's why I released it uh, second. I released it in, uh, I believe, October of 2011. Then in October 2011, I got hired to implement ZenApp 6.5 for a medical clinic. Uh, all this done remotely. I'm doing all, all, all this work remotely. Never been, other than the Zenat 5 one, never been to the customer site. And so the customer's like, hey, once you get all this done, um, can you leave us some documentation about you know all the servers and applications and all their settings and all the policies and stuff? And I was like, sweet, get paid to write another script. So that's how the Zenap 6.5 script came around. Then in March 2012, a fellow CTP hired me to do three weeks of literally babysitting for one of his customers because everyone was having to take uh, vacations and uh, go to training and stuff. They needed someone just to sit there for three weeks just in case anyone had any questions on their Zen desktop, Zen app, or PBS environments. So I get to the customer site and they're just like, oh, Oh, you're that Carl Webster. You're that accidental Citrus admin guy. And I was like, uh, yeah. Hey, you're the guy with all those documentation scripts. Yeah, we got a Zen desktop for farm. We don't have any documentation on it. And we've got like 750 developers on this thing in India and Bangladesh. Man, we'd really like some documentation on this. Can you document our Zen desktop for farm? I was like, sweet, paid to write another script. So that script only took a week because Zen Desktop 4, there were only like 10 commandlets in Zen Desktop 4 that had Git in them. So it was pretty simple. Zen Desktop 4 was pretty simple. So after a week, then they came back and said, hey, by the way, we've got a Zen, a, a PBS 5.6 farm and a PBS 6.0 farm and a PBS 6.1 farm. Can you document those for us before you leave? I was like, sweet paid to write more scripts, all right. And I actually found out that all of those could be done in one script, I didn't have to write three scripts. Uh, and then by the time I got to the PBS script, I had learned some things in PowerShell, like the switch statement, where you could actually take, oh, okay, so when the commandlet returns uh, this, but the drop down box in the console has all these options, very verbose. Oh, I can do a switch statement and say, if it returns this, I can actually print out all this information. Oh, cool. So I did that for PBS. And then eventually, uh, you'll see later, I went back and did re added all that stuff to all the other scripts that I had done. And then what really got me was after I released these scripts, I was just like, you know, who's going to find this stuff useful? I mean, it just, there were just some scripts, you know, that I did, you know, got paid for, the customer allowed me to keep on release on the stuff, even though they paid for the development, and it really surprised me. So, as of Friday, just how popular are the scripts? The Zen Desktop 4 script has been downloaded 2,000 times. 
PBS, 5,000 times. Zenf5, 7,000 times. Zenf6, 9,000 times. And then the one that blows me away, Zenf65 has been downloaded 27,000 times. For a total of 50,000 downloads. Now I've been told that if I were to get a, a pound or a quid for every one of these downloads, that I might be able to take Jim Moyle out and pay his pub tab for one night. So it's really been, and, and this is just the ones that hit Dropbox, because that's where I have all the scripts. I found out, uh, actually, I had to, Jim Moyle asked me, are you gonna do a bribe form session on your documentation scripts? And I was just like, who in the world wants to hear me talk about PowerShell scripts? And he said, well, if you don't do it, I'll do it. I said, well, all right, I know you, I'll do, this, I'll do the session. So I went out and started Googling Carl Wefter and the scripts, uh, what do they call that, ego, ego searching or something like that? Yeah. yeah, and I spent the next four hours doing nothing but hitting websites where people talk about these scripts and people are afraid that I'm going to remove the scripts or make them you know, paid scripts, so they've actually copied all the source code onto their site so that people could have access to it. And then on Experts Exchange, and then on the uh, Citrix forums, and on Brian Madden's forums, and uh, I can't remember the other site, um, where people are asking questions, well, how do I do so? Oh, Carl Webster's already got it done in his script, here's the link. I'm just like, wow, people are actually using these things. Ah, oh, people are actually finding these things useful. I was like, well, sweet. So, how have the scripts evolved? Because like I said, I'm just a regular goober. PowerShell does not come easily to me. Oh, you know, does goober translate into British UK? No. That means I'm a dork. Uh, just a regular, <laughs> you know, just a, you know, I'm just a regular guy. Uh, that's what a goober is in the United States. Just your... I've got a few contacts in Spain. Okay, all right. So the, uh, using the most popular script, the Zenep 6.5, here's what the script looked like uh, when I released it on October 7, 2011. You'll notice it's all just kind of like a rugby scrum. It's just all just mashed together, pushed together. And then I noticed things like server FQDN. That never returns anything. And all the sample documents that people have sent me, server FQDN never returned anything. And then the product. Man, that's a long string. It's got the product and it's got the addition. Is there any way I can kind of clean that up? And then operating system 64-bit for Zen F6 and Zen F65, they can only run on 64-bit. So why, uh, and then the logon control mode. You see, I just returned just what PowerShell returns, a lot of logons. And then, is the print spooler on this server healthy? Never returned any information for me, and all the sample reports people sent me, never saw anything there. So, the version two script, all the way to January 21, 2013, because uh, it's kind of weird. You're a nobody, so you start blogging to become a somebody, then all of a sudden people start recognizing your name, and then you start getting real busy, and then you start getting even busier, and all of a sudden, all the time you spent doing writing and scripting so that you could become a name, so that you become busy, you're now so busy that you don't have time to do much writing or scripting. So that's the problem I ran into. So I actually had uh, uh, three weeks uh, back in January and February where a customer actually hit pause on their project and I was just like, okay, you don't want to use me for three weeks? I'm going to go through, I'm going to start upgrading all the scripts. So January 21, 2013, I went and started cleaning up some of the stuff. Uh, you'll notice that the product and addition are now on different lines, made it a little bit easier to read. And then things that didn't return any information, like server FQDN, it's a print server, 
healthy, uh, what you already eat for, uh, that never returned any information. I just removed all that stuff from the script because it's like, if it's not going to return anything, why clog up the code with that script and why clog up the document? And then you'll see log on control mode. Now that I learned to use the switch statement, I can now actually say instead of just allow logons, it actually is allow logons and reconnections. And I went through and did that for every single item and every single uh, level node uh, in the consoles for all the scripts. And then in January 28, 2013, now back when I released the Zen F6 script back on September 30, 2011, there was a guy, Ryan Reborn, who said, hey, uh, can you, this thing do like a Word document? And I was just like, no, nah, I just manually open them up in Word. He says, would you mind if I took your script and see if I could get it to create a Word document? And I was like, that's fine with me. And so uh, back in November 2011, he then sent me the script saying, hey, I can create just the Word document and nothing else. I was like, cool. So I took it, added his stuff into the Zen F65 script and said, hey, this thing actually, it writes. It will create and write a Word document, you know, with the headings and all that stuff. I was like, well, that's not good enough because when I take these documents and I have to manually adjust them, I add a cover page, I add a table of contents, I add a footer, you know, with page numbers and all that stuff. So I found the stuff from Jeff Hicks, uh, who had, uh, uh, he did a session at some PowerShell thing in San Diego, and he uh, did a little blog post, and he put a link to where you could download all of his scripts. And so I looked at him, and I was like, cool. He actually shows you how to do a cover page and footers and page numbers and tables. I was like, sweet. So I added that to the Zen F65 script. So now you can see we have the cover page. We now have table of contents. Uh, we now have a, a table inserted into the server section. Now one thing, and I, I emailed Jeff and he didn't know, uh, I couldn't figure out how, how do you get that table aligned with the text underneath of it? Never could figure it out. And the other thing I couldn't figure out, how do you get multiple tables in one section? I couldn't figure that out at the time. So what I did is I went to a website and posted uh, all my code uh, for this section and said, what I'm trying to do is I want to do this and I want to do this. And a uh, guy responded and said, here's what you got to do. And I said, hey, great. And tested it. It worked. I said, hey, can I give you credit? You know, can I use your name and you know, give you credit? And he was like, nope. I was like, okay. So I can't use the website, can't use his name. But anyway, <laughs> a couple weeks later, I was able to take his information and then I went in and actually cleaned up the output a little more. You'll notice that now all the colons uh, line up and everything and it looks a little neater to me. And then, boom. The table is now aligned with the text underneath of it. And, hey, I got three tables in one section now. So what do the scripts do? Use the most popular script, uh, Zenith 6.5 version 3.1. So where do you find the scripts? Well, you go to carlwebster.com. I got a sticky, so this is always up at the top. And I actually, when I was doing that ego searching and going to all those, uh, finding all those websites and everything, I actually commented on every one of them that, hey, you can always find the scripts here. The scripts will always be available and they will always be free. And this is where you can always find the most current script. So you go here and then you'll browse down, since we're doing the Zenap 6.5 to where it says version 3.1 Zenap 6.5. Then you'll see I've got signed and unsigned scripts in both uh, TXT and PS1 extension. There are many places that do not allow scripts that you get off the internet to run unless they're signed. Now, DigiCert was very nice to the CTPs. They give us free certificates, even a code signing certificate. 
All I had to do was email them and say, hey, I want to start signing my PowerShell scripts. Normally it's a lengthy process to get a code signing certificate. I had mine in like 10 minutes. It was pretty amazing. So I was able to start signing the scripts and I have to make them available in TXT because a lot of companies, if you click on something that has a PS1 extension, it's automatically blocked because it's a script. They don't want scripts running. So the TST. And then for the TXT, I get a lot of requests for people whose companies block literally every file sharing site, Dropbox, Box, ShareFile, uh, you, you know, any of those, uh, they block them. They, they're not allowed to download because they want to make sure that nothing goes into or out of their enterprise environment. And so I then emailed the people the TXT and the link to the README file. And then the most important is the README file because that's where all your instructions are. And so here it lists all the prerequisites to get everything done, uh, how you can download, how you have to install the stuff. If you're gonna use configuration logging, how you have to do the UDL uh, file, and then how to run for the ZenApp 6.5. There's now four versions of the script. And what the script does, my goal is to go down through all the nodes in the console in the order listed using all the wording that you see in the console. Now, in order to clean up some of the output, especially like with the load evaluator, I've had to go in there and use like the greater than equal sign instead of saying is greater than or equal to, because then that adds, you know, like about three more inches uh, to the text. Then we go down to load evaluators, and then I skip policies. Then we go down to servers, working groups, zones, and the reason I skip policies, there's more code for the policies than there is for all the other nodes combined. So I knew it was going to take a lot more typing, so I just did it last. And I've always just kept policies last in the report. No one's ever complained that that's the one section that's out of order. And then we go and do the policies. Now in ZenApp 6 and 6.5, you don't technically have farm properties and server properties, because uh, those are can now be done through the policies. But on the farm level, you still have the configuration logging, and we'll go through and give you all the configuration logging configuration. When you're gonna run the script, you can just type in the script name, press enter, and go. It has defaults for username, company name, uh, what cover page is gonna be used. If you are a consulting company, the username would be your company. The company name would be your customer's name. And then I like the cubicles cover page. I don't know, for some reason, I just kind of like the look of it. And then I always encourage people to run the script with the dash verbose option. Not the fact that I spent hours adding all these right verbose statements, but I don't know how many emails I get. Man, I've been running the script and it's been running for like an hour. What's it doing? I was like, did you do dash verbose? No. Okay, well, in the article that I wrote for this, I actually say you really should use Dash Verbose because these scripts run a long time, and Dash Verbose actually shows you lots of information about what's going on. If something goes wrong or hangs up, you can send me a print screen of that, and I can know where it is in the script and what's hanging up. Now, for some environments, I had uh, one tester that ran this in his environment. They had 1,225 servers, they had 5,000 published applications. They had 1,000 published desktops. I don't know how many hundreds of policies they had, and load evaluators and custom administrators and stuff. For his environment, this script took three hours to run. But with the dashboard boast, you can actually see it running and stuff. And it gives you lots of information. The PBS script, I just ran for a project I just came off of. And their large PBS environment, uh, obviously one farm, uh, one site, five servers in the site, 869 target devices, uh, eight B disk, 10 device collections. Uh, the report took uh, two hours, 51 minutes to run. And for that, I actually monitored uh, the Windward process and the PowerShell process. Windward never took over 75 meg of RAM and never consumed more than uh, like 20% CPU. And the PowerShell process never took more than 40% CPU, even in that large environment. So when you go to run the script, now, I hope no one in here 
has any heart problems, this is going to be the most exciting 16 seconds of your day here. So here's what the script, when you actually run it with Dash Verbose, I can hear all your hearts now just going better and better. And this is what the script actually looks like if you actually run it with Dash Verbose. And I'm going to be adding more because there's actually, when you run in very large environments, there's actually not enough information in here. The script can actually pause, at, or you think it's pausing at points. And then once it finishes, you now have a Word document. And then here's the cubicles cover page I like. The reason I like cubicles is because the date doesn't have to be changed as far as size. Uh, you know, it's got uh, all the information that you need right there on the cover page. And then we have the table of contents. Now, I just, for, for that customer I told you I just ran the PBS script for, when I ran it for the very large environment, uh, the cover page, it was like 80 pages long. Just for, uh, I'm sorry, the table of contents was like 80 pages long. And I hated it because you got all of these like uh, whatever name colon. And to me, that's not very table of contents-y. And so I cleaned that up for the PBS script and once I get finished with my three-week uh, world tour, I'm going to go in, uh, fix the uh, table of contents for all the other scripts also. Then the configuration logging. Uh, the nice thing about this section is just, it's going to show you uh, how the configuration is set and then also the username uh, that is, has been used to connect to the configuration logging database. And then for administrators, this is a useful section because most people don't know all the administrators they've got. And if you have a lot of custom administrators, this will actually show you all the different permissions that all the administrators have. And then some people will actually take these scripts and I have some people that run the scripts on a weekly basis and some that run the scripts on a monthly basis so that they can then do a WinDiff or whatever to see the differences between the reports and see what has changed in their environment. And then the applications. And then there's been an enhancement request for this that we'll cover in just a little bit. And then the configuration logging. And then I think, um, and I've started doing some testing for the uh, Zen Desktop 5 script. And like where the change description, you see that ugly word wrapping and how the text doesn't line up. I think I have a solution for that because I was able to fix that for the Zen Desktop 5 script. And so I'm going to go back and see if I can clean that up. And then also for these load evaluators, for the description, you got the ugly word wrapping and stuff. I'm going to try and get that uh, cleaned up. And then, of course, you can see where I had to change greater than, less than, equal, whatever, uh, in order to shorten up and uh, kind of clean up the text. And then uh, on the servers, as you've seen before, it's just now nice and neat and uh, spaced out and a lot more readable than the version one. And then we list all the Citrix services. And then an enhancement request uh, is to take the services and then also the installed hotfixes, or actually the not installed hotfixes, and show them in red. Now, one thing you have to uh, remember about working with colors is you have people like me who are colorblind. And a lot of guys are colorblind. And in IT, it's mainly a male-dominated field. And the guy I'm working with uh, on the project that just came off with, he's more colorblind than I am. So if you use red text, he can't see it. He can't read it. And so what we found out is instead of using red text, if we use a red background, he may not be able to see the red, but he can tell that something is different on those cells. And so I use a bolded black text on a red background. And then also uh, the same thing like for warnings. Um, I use a bolded black text on a yellow background. I can't read yellow text. Uh, it, it disappears for me. But I can see yellow background in black text. So that's the thing when you make enhancement requests, you always have to remember that there are some people those enhancements actually affect. And if I use red text, I'd have a lot of people who wouldn't be able to read the document. And then I'm also going to take and do the not installed in red background. And then 
On April 29th, Citrix updated CPX129229, which is the recommended hot fixes for Xanax 6 and above. Uh, so now for Xanax 6.5, they now have recommended hot fixes if you have uh, HRP01 installed in your Xanax 6.5 server. And I uh, just. Yeah. <laughs> yep, that one comes off by heart. Um, so I've added that just before I went to buy for them. Uh, that was in, uh, I think the update uh, on that was May 4th. I added that in to the script. And then the zones, uh, the nice thing about this report is you have, if you have hundreds or thousands of servers, this will show you which servers are your most preferred, preferred, not preferred, default, or the ones that are worker mode only. And then all your policies. So what was the most difficult thing to do for all the scripts? Session printers were the devil. And the Zenf 6.5 session printers were the worst. For Zenf 6.5, we've actually got uh, uh, one dialog that's got three tabs and you've got lots of drop downs and lots of things that can be changed. Why was it so difficult? No documentation from Citrix. Thank you very much, Citrix. No documentation. That's it, that's all the documentation on session printers. And do you see a session printer data type? They came out with all these enum types. You see a session printer one? Mm, no, because it's not there. Citrix didn't document it. So, originally, all I could do because of my really not understanding some of the intricacies of PowerShell and how some uh, data types were stored and all that, all I could tell you is if session printers were enabled or disabled. That was it, that's all I could tell you, if I couldn't figure out the rest of it. Eventually, I did. So, after I figured out the Zen F65 session printers, this is all the PowerShell code. And yes, I had to manually type all that in because there was no documentation from systems to do any copy and paste. And I had to manually figure out every single one of those options because Citrix didn't document anything. So, for session printers, I went from four lines of PowerShell to 328 lines of PowerShell. So 300 lines of code just to get the two printers. Yep, you got it. And to make it even worse, Zen App 5 and Zen App 6 were completely different. There's Zen App 5, there's Zen App 6, session printers. You think they're the same? Nah. You think Citrix is bad with consoles? Man, they can't even keep this stuff sane and PowerShell between versions. I mean, consoles are nothing compared to what Citrix has done in PowerShell. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> so how did I figure all this stuff out? Because like I said, I'm not a PowerShell geek. I'm not a PowerShell wizard. PowerShell doesn't come easy to me. I had to brute force my way through this. So first I created a user policy just for session printers, nothing there. And then I can see that session printers. Oh, okay. The policy name is session printers. All right, I got a state and nothing much else there. All right, so now let me go and add two printers. Because I want to have a printer that I can go in there and modify, and one that would just be left alone so I could always compare. And so if I screwed something up in the code, you know, I'd be able to have some comparison. And then I noticed that, okay, they split off the server, they split off the share name, settings is either modified or unmodified, and when you create a session printer, you get this long, big box where you can enter a description and comments and all that stuff. And once you do and save it, it's all gone. It's never shown again in the console, and you can't get it back in PowerShell. So why they even ask you for all that, I have no idea. So now, I go and run my little script, and I see session printers. Okay, this is now enabled, but what the heck is this values equal system.object brackets? And why is everything else value, but session printers is values? I thought everything in PowerShell was supposed to be singular. Hmm, okay, so what do I do now? Since I can't figure out what the heck is system.object, I know that I can take the PowerShell commandlet, get CTX root policy configuration, give it my policy name, assign that to a variable, and then I can take that variable and pipe it into something called get member. And then I can see 
through here that, oh, there's a get type. Oh, okay. So I should be able to do x dot session printers dot values dot get type. Oh, it's an array. Oh, okay. So there were 11 policy settings I could never do anything with because I didn't know how to get the information out. Oh, it's just an array. I know how to work with arrays now. So once I figured that out, I was able to solve the missing entries for the other 10 items, session printers and these 10. And so I was able to go back and fill out all the rest of the policy stuff. And by the time I get, did all this, it added almost another 1,000 lines of PowerShell to the policy session just to get all these. So now I wrote a short PowerShell script just to look at the array. So I go in there and I read my uh, uh, information, get the array, and then I just loop through getting all the stuff. And then I see that, oh, oh okay, there's my server, there's my share, and then all the other stuff. Oh, okay, well actually what this is, this is an array that contains arrays. So I got nested arrays here because each of those is an array. So now what I did is I wrote a little script that gets the big array and then goes down and splits out the other arrays and then I'm able to go out here and get my server name and share name from all of that. And then the fun really begins. So now I have to make one change to one printer, run my little script, and see what the result is. And I go, okay, print quality is negative three. All right, negative three is 600 DPI. All right, then I have to go back and keep changing it to make sure that, okay. All right, so if I do 1200 DPI, it's negative four. Okay, I bet if I do 300 DPI, it's negative two. Oh, okay, it is. Okay, well, I got that one figured out. All right, that one's done. Now I have to go through and I have to rinse, let it repeat until every single one of these options are set. And I keep running the script and figuring out what all the different names are since Citrix didn't document them. I know that, okay, there's copies, collate, scale, so on and so forth until, whoop, there's the outline for all the session printer properties. And then that's all there was to figuring out the 142 undocumented Citrix policy settings for session printers. Then I had to go through and do the exact same process for ZNF6 and ZNF6 5. I mean, for ZNF5. Because you would figure that, okay, I've got it all figured out for ZNF6 5. I should be able to just copy that code because they're using the same citrix.groupPolicy.command module, right? Copy it over, ZNF6 script, <coughs> barf all over the place. Is barf the right term? Yeah, yeah barf. Okay. It just threw up all over the place. So I then had to start all over from scratch, figuring out each of the settings for ZNF6. And as you saw, the ZNF5 and the ZNF6 session printer dialogs were exactly the same. So I figured, okay, I got it figured out for ZNF6. Just copy and paste the code into ZNF5 and run it. Total bar. Had to do it all over again to figure out each one of the settings for ZNF5. Also because sisters didn't document the session printer settings for ZNF5 or ZNF6 either. So, what are some of the challenges I've run into? Well, for ZNF5, um, once I did the version 2 scripts where I came in and did all the switch statements and it was able to figure out stuff and got the, the policy stuff, you know, uh, oh, these are arrays, now I can go and fill in all this stuff. Uh, I actually took the time to build a ZNF5 2008 environment because, you know, my goal go through the console in the order that everything's in the console using the wording that's in the console and for all uh, the drop downs and everything. So I said, fine, crap, 2003 and 2008 are completely different. 2003 has isolation environment, uses HDX broadcast, but over in 2008, the session reliability is its own main node, it's not a sub node. One calls it Citrix Streaming Server, the other calls it Application Streaming. And in 2008, we got restart options. One uses HDX Broadcast, one uses ICA. Remote Console Connection, different location. Well, under the servers, we have Isolation Environment. One uses HDX Plug and Play, the other calls it ZenApp. 
and one uses HDX 3D, the other uses speed screen. Then HDX media screen, also a speed screen. Then they do things different for the flash. And then on the server side, it's the same thing. HDX broadcast, ICA, remote console connection in a different location, isolation environment, HDX plug and play, ZenApp, HDX 3D and speed screen, and media screen and speed screen and different stuff. And 2008 adds the restart schedule. And then just look at the main console for the policy. Completely different. This is the first half of the policy settings. Look at all the wording differences and location differences. Because remember my goal. Do the report in exactly the order that is shown. I can't do it for the Zen F5. Look at all the differences. So what I wind up having to do, two separate functions. One function to do the Zen F5 2003 policies, one to do the Zen F5 2008 policies. I mean, all the stuff's in different order, different locations, different levels. And then this is the second half. It's just, it's crazy. Has Citrix and Citrix are given any feedback on the inconsistency? No, because uh, Zen F5 2003 is in the life, so they don't care. And you would think they've learned their lesson for Zen F6 and 6.5. Nope. They got stuff that's in Zen F6 that's not in Zen F6.5. We got stuff that's in Zen F6.5 that's not in Zen F6. And the stuff's in different orders. And lots of wording changes. HDX media screen, media screen, media screen, Windows media redirection. And then because I want to do the stuff in the order, well, for Zen F6, multimedia conferencing is last. Zen F6.5, multimedia conferencing is first. And then Zen F6.5 adds Windows media redirection. And then we go on, Zen F6.5 adds those, and then also adds all these new computer settings that don't exist in Zen F6. And then the user policy differences. I mean, it's just crazy. And you thought they were bad just in consoles. It was the, all those differences really made it a challenge to do these scripts because of my OCD-ness of wanting to do everything in the exact order as it appeared in the console, in the exact order that everything <laughs> appeared. So other challenges. Why don't I use remoting for Zen App 5 and the Zen App 6 policies? Basically, I can't figure it out. For the Zen App 6 policies, I actually spent six hours exchanging emails with the guy who did the citrix.groupPolicy.command module. Because what I found out when I was doing, uh, adding, uh, for Zen F6 and 6.5, you know, they added remoting support. You issue this one command, uh, give it a server name, and boom, it will now, you can run the scripts on another computer and it will then remote the stuff to that computer. But the policy stuff didn't work. So I emailed the guy, because you know, I saw his name on the blog saying, hey, I've got this, you know, citrix.groupPolicy.commands module so you don't have to use the uh, PS5 stuff. I was like, this stuff's not working with remoting. He emails me back going, oh crap, when we added remoting support, we forgot about this. I was like, oh great, but it should be easy to do. Six hours of emails later, I said, screw it. I just added code into the script that says if you're using remoting, skip the group policy stuff because I couldn't figure it out. And for Zen App 5, also can't figure it out. Have you ever looked at the, the PowerShell remoting stuff? If you do these 63 things on this server, and you do these 87 things on this server, then on the second Tuesday of the sixth week of the 13th month, following the year that a politician actually tells the truth, PowerShell remoting may work. So I, I can't figure it out. Why do I not get any Zen App 6? Active Directory policies, because I can't figure it out. I'm not a PowerShell guy. I'm not an MVP. You know, uh, and to do the AD stuff requires the use of that PS Drive stuff that's in the original 
through policy stuff, and then you have to open every active directory policy because you don't know which ones contain any separate settings. And in these large enterprise environments that have hundreds or thousands of group policies, you've got to crack open every single one and read down through the entire Citrix computer and user policy sections to see if one was set. Then you'd have it documented, and then people would probably ask, well, why can't you get the rest of the stuff? But no, that's, that's another can of worms. And then, being an AD guy, my thing is, which domain controller am I gonna hit when I go to retrieve active directory policies? By default, the Group Policy Management Console uses the PDC emulator, Dismal Role Holder Domain Controller. Well, if I'm over here in the United States and my main site just happens to be in Switzerland where the PDC emulator is, that means that every time I go to crack open an Active Directory group policy, I got to traverse all the way over to Switzerland. I really don't think those AD people in Switzerland are gonna like that. And probably the WAN traffic guys are not gonna like that either. And you're probably gonna bog down the WAN trying to get that information. So as at this point, I haven't figured out an efficient way to do this. Why well, do my word scripts not support non English versions of Word? This was one that puzzled me. I had all these people from 18 different countries testing my word script. And it wasn't until the day I released it the French people went nuts. This stuff doesn't work with French Word. This stuff doesn't work with German Word. I'm in Switzerland and we use uh, our version of German and it's not working. Okay, can you send me this information? Then come to find out that what it is, is the template file for Word, the building blocks.x file. It's a different name in French and German, Italian and Russian. And I've learned there's a PSD1 file that contains your uh, translation stuff that you can use for all your different locales but I hadn't figured out how to actually implement that so that the uh, template file, the table of contents, the footer, the table name, and then the heading one, heading two, heading three, heading four, and default all had to be translated into all the other languages. And then how far do you want to take it? Do you want all the right verbose statements? Do you want all the output in the other language? Or do you just want the, you know, Pray like it is, but just support the non versions of Word, non English versions of Word. And why do my scripts not return objects? Simple. I can't figure out how to make an object out of that. What? The table? No. All the server properties, then all the Citrix services, and then all the Citrix hotfixes, and then all the Microsoft hotfixes. How do you make a cohesive object and say this is a server object? And you don't know what all. New dash object. Okay, you can help me later. <laughs> <laughs> so, I need your help. Is there anyone here who can help me some, right? Because I need help, because I know lots of people are asking. Lots of people are asking for that stuff. I'm just one guy. You know, I'm just a goober. So, I need help trying to solve some of these uh, issues that to me, are not solvable at this point in my PowerShell knowledge. So what about the, the current scripts? There's been a lot of enhancement requests. Add information on applications installed on Zen App servers. That is not easy. Because when you install something like Microsoft Word, you don't get just Word, PowerPoint, Excel, Outlook, whatever. You get lots of miscellaneous software installed. So what all do you want to see on your report? And I need to separate that wheat from the chaff. Add hardware information on servers. Ooh, this one made me shudder because I'm thinking back to that first time I used WMI and started shutting down every one of those NetApp servers. You know? So I'm sure there are more efficient ways because I have learned they're supposed to filter on the left, not the right. Haven't figured out exactly what that means, but that's supposed to make it more efficient. And then create an offline file for CTX129229, which is the 
I've used this so many times that yes, it just rolls off my tongue. Follow with that. Not everyone who runs a script has internet access. Some people run these scripts actually in very highly secure environments, which is amazing for me to know that some people have gotten emails from where they're running these scripts. It's just like, oh. That's where the code and book people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also what's amazing are the emails I get from huge enterprise, I mean global uh, consulting companies that now use all my scripts, all the ones that generate the work documents, that's what they use for their end of engagement documentation to the customer. They're using my scripts. I'm just like, you're kidding. Wow, sweet. But, oh, the other problem before I go to that. Uh, if, if I have to maintain an online file with updates and people don't have internet access, and I also have to change the script, why would I do both? Why would I have to change? Why would I just update the script? Because I gotta update the script anyway. So to me, that was a catch-22. Add an appendix for ZenApp servers to show major items, addition, model, license server. When I was doing the ZenApp 5 script uh, for that customer, what I noticed was that not every server was set for the same product addition or used the same license server. And so I brought that up to them. They were like, oh, they're all supposed to be the same. So I created a, a script that's on my website, finding mismatched servers. If you've never read the help text for that and you're into Star Trek, you really should read the help text for that script because it's full of Star Trek stuff. Add an appendix for ZenApp applications to show settings in a table. And this would be for settings like um, the things that affect uh, session sharing so that people can actually see and, and compare. And then for the PBS servers to show advanced settings so that people can see the differences in their PBS servers. Future scripts, I've been asked, you're gonna have an Excalibur script? Netscaler, PBS Next, Storefront, Zen Desktop 5, and Zen Server. Now, Zen Desktop 5, we've kinda have started on it, I've started playing around with it, because man, it's such a really Screw the pooch on the PBS and Zen Desktop PowerShell stuff. I mean, it's really horrible. <coughs> uh, it's whatever the PowerShell command looks for return. That's what we'll be handling. So, have a vote. Which one do y'all want? Excalibur? Nestinner? PBS? Next? Not? Right. Storefront? Zen Desktop. Uh, that's what I thought. And Zen Server. All right. Uh, well, we've already started on Zen Desktop. I've got a guy, uh, Kenny Baldwin, that used to work for Citrix, uh, that did the, I believe, the Zen Desktop Site Checker tool. And he's working with me uh, on that because do that guy knows PowerShell. Woo! All right. Any questions? Any suggestions or comments? Keep on doing it. Oh, keep on doing it. <laughs> I will. I will. Is so any comments are good. You thought, okay, so you're talking about documentation with PowerShell and Citrix specific. You know, when you came across, and I know you've got a background in AD and, and exchange and that kind of stuff. Any good resources just to say testing our Google skills on general AD, exchange, Actually, PowerShell documentation? If you've been to my session on the 10 things in AD, um, I'm, I'm I removed that from the future scripts, uh, but I am planning on doing the uh, 10 things in AD uh, and writing a PowerShell script that documents all that stuff. You know, uh, the forest, fourth level, domain levels, you know, any trust, flashing services, so, all the subnets. And so tell the people the, the full title of that session, so 10 things in AD. Oh, 10 things in Active Directory that can uh, screw up your application and desktop virtualization uh, efforts and how to fix them. So yes, I will be doing an AD script. Uh, it's much easier in 2012. So, and then also, um, okay, we know there's PBS Next. Uh, Excalibur has been uh, TP General, or you had to request 
but for general or for specific people? Uh, so there is one for general. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so if it's general, I can make this statement. The one the CCP puts up now, mm -hmm. yeah, it's just the, the, the sticker on the top. Any of the branding that we can't say here. No, I'll do, I'll do no branding. But in playing around with Excalibur and PBS Next, it should probably take me less than an hour to do PBS Next into the current PBS script. So once that is generally released, because uh, I can do the script now, but I work from Citrix, I don't do nothing until the product is actually released. So I will do it. It should take less than an hour. Uh, Excalibur, uh, the SDK for it is very similar uh, to another product, and so we should be able to take what we're doing for that product and use most of the script for Excalibur but it will have to be a completely separate script because of all the additional stuff that's in this calibre. Was that good wording without violating the NDA? Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, how easy is PBS PowerShell to really discern? PBS PowerShell sucks because uh, PBS, they did as a wrapper around MCLI command line stuff, and so it actually returns an array of strings. And so I actually had to write a function that actually strips out that stuff and then actually creates objects for it. And it was not that easy to do because it's like almost all the different things want different things out of the uh, MCLI git type stuff. So there was one set of calls to MCLI git that I was not able to use that function for. But it, it, uh, the PowerShell one was uh, brutal to do because of how horrendous, I mean, sorry, how not PowerShell-y the PBS uh, PowerShell stuff is, and also Zen Desktop is not very PowerShell-y. Because you would think you'd be able to do like get XD site, get XD controller, get XD whatever. Nah, no, they don't do that. The proper PowerShell way is not done. They, they could have done better. And then also, uh, people would ask me, will my scripts run under PowerShell 3? No, I've had some people attempt them and they get all kinds of errors with my stuff. All my scripts are now done with set uh, strict mode dash version two, which finds all kinds of typos and errors in the scripts and all of those have been fixed. So uh, the version three and above scripts they all run with set strict mode, so there's absolutely no errors that are detected by running in set strict mode or in the script. Don't forget to fill out your evaluations. Thank you very much for coming and uh, letting me talk about PowerShell. Thank you.